Corner Fringe Ministries presents a 12-part series on the divine nature of God. Please enjoy the study. Well, we are finally here. We are at week 12 of our divine nature of God study. And this is going to be the conclusion of this series. And, you know, up to this point, I've pretty much said all that I want to say regarding the divine nature of God, regarding the deity of Yeshua, that he is, in fact, more than just a man, that he himself is God. However, today, I am actually going to cover a couple of additional items, and then I'm going to give a closing argument that shows, just, just summarizing, more of a summation, if you will, of looking at the finer points, the evidence, proving that Yeshua is truly who he said he was, the Son of God, being a chad with his Father, thus being God himself. Now, Before I get started, last week I made a statement that I'm not fond of the term Trinity. Many of you picked up on this when I had said that, and I piqued your curiosity. So uh, before we get started, I want to address that and give you a further clarification of what I was referring to. Now, while I don't have a problem per se with the term Trinity in and of itself, I personally don't often use the term because there's a lot of baggage that is associated with this term, that comes with this term. Um, Thanks to the history of the Catholic Church with the Jewish people, the term carries some very, very dangerous presuppositions. If you look at the history, um, you know, not long ago, I would say probably five, six, seven years ago, the Pope himself had to come out in an apology Uh, for slaughtering millions of Jews, all in the name of Christ. These forced conversions, part of the forced conversion would be that literally the Catholic Church would force conversion, and part of that conversion, and you can find this in history, uh, it's been documented that they would have to confess the Trinity. And so the term carries, uh, uh, carries a lot of baggage with it. Now, This doesn't mean that I never use the term. I do use the term, but I am careful how I use the term or with whom I use the term. For example, if I'm speaking with an Orthodox Jewish person, um, this is going to be a term that I'm going to stay away from, that I'll be careful not to use. You know, I think we have enough to conquer when attempting to witness to the Jewish people without adding to the situation, to add into the list. And lest we forget, the term Trinity itself is never found in the Bible. It's not there. And you know what? A Jewish person will call you out on it. They'll say, you're talking about a trinity. Find it for me in Scripture. And you'll look for the word itself, and you won't find it. And our Unitarian friends will come at you, and they say trinity does not exist in Scripture. Now, having said that, as I said before, I'm not dogmatic in the sense that I never use the term. If I know my audience, if I know where they're coming from, I may use the term. Why? Because the term itself, depending on who I'm talking to, is a very simple way for me to express to that person my theological belief on God, the divine nature of God. The Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh are God. It's very simple. So, with that said, I hope that pacifies you. Um, With that said, I want to begin today by reading to you a Jewish perspective on the Trinity give you some deep insight into the mind of the Jewish people today and how they view this term, Trinity. And this is taken from the Encyclopedia of Judaism. And we begin reading. We take up Christianity first. At issue is how far can we distinguish Christianity from Judaism, either in Christianity's early forms or in the guise of Messianic Judaism or Jews for Jesus today. Is Christianity perhaps even a sibling of rabbinic Judaism with equal claim to inherit earlier biblical Judaism? Applying our criteria, the answer is clear. Christianity in none of its forms qualifies as either Judaism or its sibling. In other words, they're not compatible belief systems. They're incompatible with each other. We continue. While deeply indebted to biblical Judaism, Christianity so changes... Listen to this. So changes each of the three basic elements of normative Judaism that is rightly viewed as a different religion. First of all, the God is very different. A triune divinity. And one of the three modalities is a divine human being. 
something inconceivable with the normative Judaism. I want you to notice the first thing that Judaism mentions showing incompatibility with Judeo-Christianity or even more liberally Christianity. Shows this incompatibility. The first thing they mention is the triune nature of God. This is what is being called into question. This is the foremost primary issue they have with Christianity. Is that we say that there are three gods. We continue. The transcendent God found in the Old Testament who created the universe, formed Israel, and bestowed the Torah is generally identified by Christians with only one modality of the triune God. The one term, God the Father. And God the Father has only secondary importance compared with God the Son, who became a human being, died, and then was resurrected so as to become a universal Savior. Now I need to interrupt here, and you need to understand there's a great misrepresentation presented here. And that is that nowhere in Scripture, in the New Testament, nowhere will you find such a, a theological belief being espoused that... Yeshua is exalted above the Father. The Father is a secondary God. You will find no such thing. Actually, you'll find just the opposite. Yeshua went out and did the will of the Father. He prayed to the Father. We give glory and honor and power to Yeshua, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2. He sits at the right hand of the Father. Do you see the misconception here? But this is what they are taught to the believe that we believe. Now, is this saying, I need to be careful here, is this saying that no Christian has ever fell into this trap? I am not saying that. Of course they have. But if you look at the New Testament and let it speak for itself, you will find no such claim. We continue. In this modality, God is allegedly revealed for the first time or in perfected form, as filled with grace, love, and compassion, in contrast to the Old Testament God. Aha! See, now we're getting somewhere of where they're drawing from. This statement has, uh, is a statement really reflecting Gnosticism, or even more so, Marcionism. Marcionism, where Marcion taught that the Old Testament God He is a hateful and a vengeful God, a wrathful God. Where's the God of the New Testament? Oh, he's a God of compassion, a God of love. And interestingly enough, in Marcionism, this God is exalted over the Old Testament God. That God is subservient to the New Testament God. We continue. Salvation, according to Christianity, can be attained not through belief in God, the Father alone, nor even in following the Torah commandments, but only through accepting Yeshua HaMashiach, God the Son, and acknowledging the atoning effect of his crucifixion and resurrection in divine form. Again, I just want to mention here, this is another misconception. This is, this is a misconception that uh, we don't believe in the Father. Our confession in Yeshua is the confession that we believe in the Father. It's that simple. That's how it works. Do you see how Satan comes in to divide and conquer? To strip them of this knowledge? We continue. Only then is there a saving experience of God, the Holy Spirit. From a traditional Jewish perspective, all this is totally alien. In other words, all this nonsense that we're babbling on about, about a triune, the Father, Son, and Spirit, this is foreign, this is totally alien to the Jewish people. And they allude to the fact it's always been alien. It's alien to the Hebrew Bible. This is where they're coming from. We continue. There are no dying and rising gods. No divine human humans in the Torah. If we look for antecedents, meaning past history, If we looked at antecedents, however, it is evident that such a conception of God would have seemed natural within the pagan religions all around ancient Israel. uh, Divinization of human beings was commonplace. 
Moreover, these religions were increasingly being refined into philosophical monotheism and had long known as their central revivifying drama the cycle of the dying and rising God. The purpose of showing you all this is to give you some perspective into the Jewish mind. Much of what was said here, the Unitarians, of course, would 100% agree with. Other organizations would agree with. Jehovah's Witness. Many people view the Trinity theology as nothing more than a pagan religion. And again, I will reiterate, this is one of the primary reasons why the Jews have not accepted or even given Judeo-Christianity a chance. Note, it was the very first reason mentioned in the Encyclopedia of Judaism. Now, if you remember in week one, I asked a question. And up to this point, I haven't answered it. And the question was, could something that has caused such a stumbling block for the Jewish people be truth? Because make no mistake, this ideology, this theology of a triune God, or of, a, of our God being in, in, in a divine form, in triune form, to them is heretical. It is a stumbling block. Could it be truth? Well, I'm going to answer this question with scripture, with a prophecy found in Psalm 118.22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Of course it's possible. The fact that the Jewish people have rejected the concept or the revelation of God through his only begotten son, this was to be expected. It's what the prophets foretold of. This is exactly what scripture said would happen. That he would be a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Isaiah chapter 8. You know, if his people didn't reject him, we would have a problem with Yeshua being the Messiah. Because according to Scripture, they had to reject him. And what was it about him that they rejected? His testimony of who he was, the Son of God. For the last 11 weeks, I've shown you that the Father is God. I didn't spend a whole lot of time because there's no debate between all of us. There's no debate. Father is God. We agree on that. But I've also shown that Yeshua is God, that he is deity. And then last week we looked at the Spirit. Well, we looked at the Spirit. He is God. Clearly, he has a will. He intercedes. He's a witness. He testifies, right? He does all these things. He's likened to God. But do we ever find the three mentioned together? This triunity as we espouse. Actually, we do. We find in Scripture all three are actually mentioned together in perfect unison and perfect harmony. Now, I will admit some of the passages are more concealed, but this is no difference than the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Some of the Messianic prophecies are more hidden in plain view, while others are blatantly overt, blatantly obvious. It's the same thing with the divine nature of God. So let's go to Scripture and see what we can find in regard to the Father, Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh. Romans 15.30 Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Paul, he, he begs the Romans here to strive with him in prayers to God, but he does it in a very specific way. Through Yeshua, through the love of the Spirit, unto God the Father. It's interesting that all three are mentioned here when we connect with God. This connection. Ephesians 2.17 And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who are near. For through him, Yeshua, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Think about that for a second. This is a triune statement. The redemption of mankind is described here. How the relationship works between us and God, how we're connected. It's the divine nature of God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. We read, There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are uh, differences in ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God, who works all in all. Paul is very intentional here. He's very deliberate in his delivery. 
I mean, he could have just as easily said here, oh, there are diversity of gifts but the same spirit, differences in ministries but the same spirit, diversities of activities but the same spirit. But Paul doesn't do that. He says, it is the same spirit, it is the same Lord, it is the same God. All these activities that are coming forth from God, Father, Son, and Spirit. This is a triune statement. This is a revelation of the divine nature of our God. Paul was very clever. We find him doing the same, saying the same exact thing in Ephesians chapter 4. A little differently. We read, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It's an amazing statement. One spirit, one Lord, one God. It's showing the revelation of the divine nature of our God. Go to 1 Peter. Peter, in writing to his Jewish brothers, he states in verse 1, this is his introduction, his salutation, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit in obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. This is his introduction from the Lord. This is his introduction to his Jewish brothers. He reveals the divine nature of God here. How God manifests himself to mankind for the purpose of redemption, for the purpose of relationship, intimacy. You don't have to look real hard in Scripture concerning the triune nature of God. It is there. It's the truth. This isn't something that is made up or it's an adoption of paganism. Certainly I'm not saying that the church in general isn't guilty of allowing paganism to breach her walls. That would be an erroneous statement because it has. But in regard to the spiritual revelation of who God is, Scripture is not elusive. The Scriptures are clear. If you go with an open heart, seeking God, you will find them. You know, the fact that other religions in past history served a triune God, right? Or gods, multiplicity, it doesn't matter. There are pagan parallels all over the Bible to, to stories like Noah and the Flood. There's a pagan parallel to Noah and the Flood. Does that make Noah and the Flood, does that discount it? Of course, it's irrelevant. You know, the fact that there's all these pagan religions with all these triune gods is meaningless to me. Our ideas of how things work, of how redemption works, of how love works, how the end times unfold, and how we understand the divine nature of God should be developed one way, exclusively through the Word of God. It's that simple. Listen to how Paul bids farewell to the Corinthians in his second epistle to the Corinthians. He states, the grace of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach and the love of God and the communion of the Ruach HaKodesh be with you all. Amen. How amazing that. He bids farewell with the name of God. The manifestation, the, the, the divine nature of our God. Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh. It's a triune statement. Let me show you the most overt one in all of Scripture. Matthew 28, 18, establishing his kingdom, the kingdom of God. He states, And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is a triune statement. This describes the Godhead. This is the revelation of the God of Israel, the God we serve, the God who has redeemed us. Is our God three independent gods? No. He is one God. The great God of Israel is Achad. He is one. Now, to a Unitarian in the unbelieving Jew, 
Statements like the ones we just read, they make absolutely no sense. Why? Because they're not mathematically challenged. They know that 1 plus 1 plus 1, it equals 3. Okay? They graduated kindergarten. They understand these things. And yet, Judeo-Christianity has the audacity to go out and tell them 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. So, yes, on the surface, aesthetically, we could look a little foolish. Well, I want to show you why, mathematically, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. I want to show you in scriptures. I want to share with you one of the four most fundamental principles in all of the Torah. It's something I've taught on several times. And that is found in Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness shall not rise against any man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. One witness cannot rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. It has to be established on the testimony of two or three. Okay? All matters, pay attention here, all matters scripturally are established on the testimony of two or three. And we find this principle is literally woven throughout the tapestry of scripture. Let me give you a few examples. We look at the tablets of the testimony. Did they come down from Mount Sinai as one tablet? That sure would have been much easier for him to carry, right? He could have fit all the font on there. We could have put all the commandments on one tablet. Why did they have to come down on two tablets? Because the thing is established by God. It is a valid testimony against Israel. It was a valid testimony against the world. It is valid. Let me show you another one. Interestingly enough, it's, it's related to the tablets themselves. The Hebrew Bible... Did you know it's referred to not as just one? It's referred to as two, as the law and the prophets, right? Is this a coincidence? This is not a coincidence. That means it is established. It is valid. It has been validated by God. All things are established on the testimony of two or three. And what's so interesting about this these were the very ones to bear witness of Yeshua. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God, referring to Yeshua, apart from Torah, is revealed being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Yeshua was testified by the testimony of two. And we even find at times the Hebrew Bible is broken into three parts. What we call the Tanakh. The Tanakh is an acronym. It stands for the Torah, that is the law. The Navim, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. And you'll even find Yeshua refers to the Hebrew scriptures most oftentimes on the testimony of two, the law and the prophets. But we also find him using this formula, the Tanakh, at the end of Luke. All things are established on the testimony of two or three. Is it any coincidence that Yeshua, when he went out, sent his disciples out to proclaim the kingdom of God that he sent them out two by two? Why? It's established. It's valid testimony of who they were and the message that they brought. When Moses spoke to the children of Israel before they came into the land of promise, Moses warned the children of Israel that don't you dare follow other gods. Don't you dare do wickedly. Don't you fall into sin. I bring a charge against you. And he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over to the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. Those who were called to witness against Israel, was it one witness? It was heaven and and it was earth. It was a valid witness. It was a valid testimony. This is the governing principle that is woven throughout Scripture. This is a governing principle that is woven throughout the universe. Just consider creation for a moment. We go to Genesis 1.5. 
Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. How fascinating is that? Our days are established on the testimony of two. This is our creator expressing himself, and that even one day is expressed and solidified and testified of, made valid, because it has a testimony of two. The evening and the morning were the first day. If we even look at the heavens for a moment, we realize that our heavens have two great lights. Not one, but two. We have the sun and we have the moon. Just consider how everything grows. Everything that has life on the earth, it is on the testimony of two or three. We have the sun and we have water. You take the sun out of our solar system and we got nothing. We got a frozen lake. No life is done. Yet, you can have as much sun as you want. You take the water out of this, out of the earth, and there's no life. Right? And we need earth, the testimony of three, by which stuff can put its roots into and draw minerals and grow with the sun and water. Everything is established on the testimony of two or three. It's amazing. Look at the heavens. Biblically speaking, now I know they have the ionosphere, stratosphere, and atmosphere, and all that stuff. The scientists have divided it up differently. Biblically, do you know that the Bible divides the heavens into three? All things are established on the testimony of two or three. We have the cloudy heavens. These cloudy heavens. Then we have the second heavens, which are the starry heavens. But then we have a heaven that is unseen. You cannot see. It is hidden because it is the highest heaven. It is where our God dwells. Listen to the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 too. I know a man in, in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise. And he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. What about the food that God has created to be received in our bodies? It is established on the testimony of two. We cannot eat any animal, any meat that does not have cloven hooves and choose the cud. They have to do both. They could have cloven hooves, but if they don't chew the cud, you cannot eat it. It's the testimony of two. What about the fish in the sea? Everything that is in the sea, according to Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, the only things that we can eat in the sea, they must have fins and scales. Both. Because God has established it. These are the only things we're allowed to eat. Testimony of two. And it goes beyond that realm. It goes into the visions and dream realm, where we find Pharaoh, back at the time of Joseph, he has not one dream, but he has two dreams. He dreams, his first dream, seven cows, seven good cows and seven poor cows, and then seven good stocks of grain in the second dream and seven poor stocks. Listen to what is said in Genesis 41. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice, because the thing is established by God. And God will bring it, or will shortly bring it to pass. Over and over again, we find this is woven throughout the universe. Let's go to the throne of God. We don't find one carabim. We find two. All things are established on the testimony of two. What's so fascinating, when you read in Exodus, do you know that these carabim were actually made of one piece with the mercy seat? Made of one piece with the mercy seat. Think about that. What about man? How was man created? We covered this. He is dust, Genesis 2, and he is the breath, the ruach of God. And man doesn't exist until what happens? The two come together. When dust and the breath of God come together, man becomes a living being. It is the testimony of two or three. Paul identifies when man is alive, he identifies them as body, soul, and spirit. The testimony of three. 
What about the five senses? This is, we could do this all day long. The five senses, the senses that we were given by God. Eyes, everything that we see is established on the testimony of two. Everything that we hear, how many ears do you have? Established on the testimony of two. Our lips, everything that we taste is established on the testimony of two in multiple ways. We may have one tongue, but we have two lips. And I don't know if you know this, but if you cannot smell, we have one nose but two nostrils. You cannot taste. Touching. I have two hands. Right? My hands, whatever I put my hands to, are established. It is a testimony. Everywhere I walk, God designed us to have two legs. We're established on the testimony of two or three. We're just scratching the surface. I could go on for months. Do you think maybe, just maybe, the Lord is trying to convey something over and over again? We find the testimony of two and three. Look at the tabernacle. The tabernacle designed by God himself. We have the outer court. All this. That's one part. We have the holy place. That's the second part. And we have the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the most holy place. Everything is established on the testimony of two or three. Might God be telling us something about his nature? Think about it. It's woven throughout the, throughout the scriptures. It's woven throughout the universe. Might God be trying to tell us something about who he is, his divine nature? He is established on his own testimony of two and three. Listen to Paul in Romans one twenty one. He says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... They're clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. We are without excuse. So they are without excuse. What an amazing statement that the things that are made, just some of the things that we looked at today, they reveal to us, according to Paul, the divine nature of God. Theates in the Greek Literally, the divine nature of God, the Godhead. He has revealed himself. We are without excuse because God has left us a valid testimony. Which makes the following statement uh, a passage of clarification. And that is, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is not three, but he is one. This is a passage of clarification. We have a great example. Let me bring this example down to the physical realm so that we can understand in the physical realm a spiritual concept. Something that God has made in this realm. It's called marriage between a man and a woman. Genesis 2.24 states this, Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become basar achad shall become one. Achad. The very same Hebrew word we just read in Deuteronomy 6.4. The Shema. Think about this. If I had a married couple stand up against the wall, I ask, how many people do you see? Provided you're in your right mind and not intoxicated, you are going to tell me, I see two people. I see two people. But if you look in the spiritual realm, With the eyes of God, if you look in the Spirit, you would not see two. You would see one. They are one. This is what God said. The two shall become one flesh. In the physical realm, I see two. In the spiritual, I see achad. I see one. No one can know the things of God except the Spirit of God. It's time we get the Spirit, amen? Amen. The only way that we're going to understand the Father, Son, in spirit, is by truly looking through spiritual eyes. I want you to consider a tree for a minute. 
Just look at the tree. It has many branches, many limbs, but it is one tree. The human body has many parts, but it is one body. So understand this concept of the Father and Son in spirit being a chad. It isn't such a difficult concept to understand once you start looking at that which God has created. When you start looking at the totality of His Word. When you look at the testimony of His Son, Yeshua. We find this principle is taught everywhere. It's woven throughout the universe. It's woven throughout Scripture. I want to present my closing argument. It's just a basic recap of all the evidence concerning Yeshua being God because he is literally the Son of God being a chad with his Father. Number one, consider, and these are going to be ten points. He created heaven and earth. This is something only God has done. Okay, There's no dispute on this. And yet we find Yeshua was involved in creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. This is God. We're talking about God here. Number two, he gives life. Again, this is a quality that only belongs to Yahweh, to God himself. John 5.21, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. He gives life. And if that weren't enough, we find that he has life within himself, something that only God has. Only God has life within himself. We read, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Number four, Yeshua is the judge. The judge. You go to the Old Testament, you go to the Tanakh, and you find Yahweh is judge. Did something change, or was there a revelation of who Yahweh is? Of course, it's the revelation. Yeshua says, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Number five, Yeshua works miracles. You know, Yeshua, he, he did things that no one else has done. Okay, that's an attribute of God. The Pharisees couldn't debate him because of his wisdom. The winds and seas could not refuse him because of his authority. He commanded them to stand still, and they stood still. All authority is given to him. He's powerful. And not just that, he defies all rational logic. He walked on water. This is not something you find being done very often in Scripture. Never. All right? Blind men receiving their sight. According to John chapter 9, that too had never ever been heard of since the creation of the world. That the blind were receiving their sight. And Yeshua could just but speak the word. And they were healed. Number six. He was worshipped. From the very moment that Yeshua was manifest in the flesh, we find that he was worshipped as a baby. He was just brought into the world, revealed where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And what happens? Three wise men, three magi come from the east, literally bow down to a baby and worship the king of Israel. He was worshipped all throughout his ministry where he's going on healing. He is worshipped. He was worshipped by his apostles. And not just that, we can take it to the next level by reading Philippians 2.10. That at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is kurios, is Lord, what the Septuagint translates from the word Yahweh, yod heh vav to the glory of God the Father. So the worship isn't maintained or isn't concealed to just this earth it reaches the heavens and the heavenly hosts fall down before the lamb they worship him he is worshiped in heaven on earth and under the earth and every knee will bow all authority is his this is a god attribute and all things are his listen to what he says this statement nobody can make this statement except Yeshua, because it would be blasphemy. And that is, all things that the Father has are mine. 
None of us can make that statement. I don't care how righteous you think you are. They are not yours. They only belong to one. Because he is a chad with his father. He is one. And think about where Yeshua made specific statements that of, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you run around telling people to keep your commandments? No. That's blasphemy. That's insane. But you go to Exodus 20, and what are the commandments? It is stated by Yahweh, the God of Israel. They are his commandments. And yet when Yeshua comes on the scene, he says, they are my commandments. There's an association here between him and the Father. All right? And think about the other statement that he made that the sheep are his. Yeshua says, they are my sheep. They are my sheep. You go to the Old Testament, it says, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yahweh is the chief shepherd. And yet Yeshua is called the chief shepherd, the great shepherd. And they are his sheep. What about the kingdom of God? Yeshua actually calls the kingdom of God my kingdom. Think about that statement. John 18, verse 36 Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants, speaking of the host of heaven. How many of you can state that, hey, the angels are my servants? Nobody can make that statement, but God alone. My servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Number eight is something we never covered, because I knew I would cover it in the closing statement. And it's definitely a God thing. And that is, He forgives sins. Yeshua forgave sins. Luke 5.20 When Yeshua saw their faith, He said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Agreed. I agree. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Open your eyes unto the revelation of Yahweh. Number nine, we have to consider Yeshua's own testimony, right? And what was his testimony? I and my father are achad, a play off of the Shema. He also said, I'm the son of God. Do you remember? This is a testimony that got him killed. This is why he was brought to the stake because of his testimony that I am the Son of God. And it is that very testimony that is under attack today. Satan, when Yeshua began his earthly ministry, the first thing that was attacked was this testimony. And it is still happening to this day. It is not a coincidence. And I want to share with you, I didn't put this up here, but I wanted to share it with you to show you how important it is that you make this testimony, that you understand this, that this is not something that we can say that I agree to disagree because this is salvational. John 3.33, Yeshua says, He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. If you go to 1 John chapter 5, if you do not receive his testimony, you make God a liar. Now you tell me if that's salvational or not whether we confess him to be who he said he was, the son of the living God. And last but not least, we have number 10. His names. My goodness. You get to know him quite well by the names that were given to him. And this is just a portion of his names. There's many, many, many other names. I'm just pointing out a couple of them. Number one, Emmanuel. God with us. Think about that name. Son of God. Literally, the Son of God. He was the Word of God. He's the Word made flesh. He's the Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. And He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And not just that, but He's called faithful and true. The way, the truth, the life, the shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, wonderful counselor, mighty God, El Gibor. Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Think about those names. They are His names. And last but not least, Scripture just comes out and tells us that He is Yahweh Zekenu, the Lord our righteousness. 
Jeremiah 23. He's literally called Yahweh. The Tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God. The Lord, our righteousness. We're going to end here for today. The music team can come back up. Thank you.